let's get practical and a little bit more granular now. As you continue to tell the story, please, you know, continue the evolution. But I also want to answer some of the questions I know my audience really needs to know, mm-hmm. which include things like bidding and, you know, branding. Yes. Um, but also you've talked a lot about how to combat when you have clients who say, well, that's too expensive or yes. maybe just uh, addressing negotiation or rejection or sure. justifying, especially as a designer, you know, it's, it's very easy to, to put you and me, you know, as a, so sometimes I get called a videographer and it's very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I would not call yeah. you that, Ryan. Well, you know, it's true. I mean, I can hold a camera and I can yeah. point and click and record stuff. And so, you know, you might want to bring me out as a videographer, you know, uh, to shoot something. But it's like I'm a little different than the guy you hire to come shoot your real estate. Um, it's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really easy to put us into the commodity category, I guess. Right. right. So right. maybe can we start there? Sure. Um, and I love these. I actually love these role plays that you do. I think they're super mm-hmm. effective and I've learned a lot from them. Just, you know, bird dogging what you're doing, mm-hmm. break it down for us. Okay. okay. There's a couple of things that you're talking about is that I think people's understanding of the, the nuances of what other people do is fairly finite and they're, they're saving their calories for their brain for something else. And so they want to put a label on you. So when they see you and they see you on camera, they're like, well, he's got lights and he knows what he's doing with the camera. Closest thing I know is you're a video shooter or you're a YouTuber. And that's okay. I don't really pay much attention to that. And that's fine because this is now my job to step in and help them understand what it is that I do. But I do it through the lens of how can I serve you? Mm-hmm. So a lot of people in our space, uh, especially if you're a designer, the creative person running a small business, you've not been actually taught by anybody that's credible, in my opinion, on anything other than how to make the craft part of it, right? Like you can probably draw really well. You can probably make a beautiful mark. But all the client skills, the communication skills, the negotiations, these are things that creative people tend not to want to learn and have probably not been taught it or taught poorly by somebody else who's not done well themselves. And so I'll go we, a step, I'll go a step okay, further. Go ahead, please. And some people say that, that we're bad at it. Now, I happen to like it. Mm-hmm. But my mm-hmm. wife is also an artist. She actually okay. paints and restores furniture. She's a real artist mm-hmm. in the sense of the traditional word. Right. And she absolutely like, it repels her. She's, she almost yeah. feels like I'm not being an artist when I start talking about money mm. or you know projects. It's like it's very hard for her to do. Mm-hmm. So there's this idea that's been made very popular within the art and creative community that if the two shall ever mix, then you're doing some bastardized prostitute version of art and yes and if we continue to live in that space we'll forever be the starving artist yeah some of the most successful people that you know today have been able to jump that divide and to learn to speak the language of business whether you're a comic book artist a videographer a fine artist a street artist you start to understand market value supply and demand and that you've maybe to some point maybe not solved but at least have wrestled with this whole scarcity demon that a lot of people fight and that's the idea that if I say no to this client or if I just lower my price a little bit, they'll say yes. And I need this because the next opportunity is not going to be here. Yeah, and or, I'm, on, or I'm competing against someone. Yeah, right. for sure. Yeah, And they feel that because they feel like there's that finite amount of opportunities and that every no is like one less that they're able to get in their lifetime. And I found that that is not it at all. Now, luckily for me, I think it was just because of probably stupidity and arrogance when I was straight out of school, I had this abundance mindset. Like, cause to me, all of this stuff was more than I ever thought I was going to get anyways. So every day was like a, a positive, like a one put a one in the win column for me. So I always played this game and, and I'm in my uh, like uh, early twenties here. I think I, I finished school around 22. And every time the client would ask how much I would just try a new number, a new rate to see like, when do they say no? And the threshold for them saying no was actually really high. And so I went from earning probably $30 an hour as a freelancer while still in school to earning seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars a day within months. 
so right so there was a big transition there and it was a really fun game to play like how do i get the client to say no i was yeah. operating that way and they kept saying yeah so i i, I knew then keep asking for more yeah. and I, i'd love to share this story with you i was freelancing and uh, even though i had a business i was freelancing uh doing storyboards for main titles for free for feature films and I, I was working uh, with one of the most well-known uh, main title designers, Kyle Cooper, and I kept charging him more and more. The reason why I did this was because I had a small team of friends who were working with me. So we weren't doing the work of one person. So naturally, I was charging more. I didn't have the guts to tell him that there was a whole team of us because I thought he was going to get really upset. Yeah. So one day, his producer calls me up. He's like, Chris, you just sent us a bill for X day rate, and that's ridiculous. We don't pay anybody that amount. I totally got it. And I was still pretty cocky. So I'm like, you know what? Ask Kyle what he thinks. If he doesn't think we're doing that level of work, then we'll adjust the bill. If that was the end of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so it was like kind of like me growing up into the business part. Now, if I were to rewind the tape and take you back to like when I was eight or nine years old, I, like many entrepreneurs, have failed at many different kid hustle jobs, you know, where I tried a car washing business that didn't work. I tried to sell uh, crayfish that I caught in the creek that didn't work out because I'm a terrible salesperson, but I was very entrepreneurially driven. I would used to like run home from junior high. Uh, bring my bag in a duffel bag popsicles to the elementary kids and sell them. But the, the window to sell them was very finite because my my goods were melting literally away. My profits were being melted. So I'm like, here, yeah. take a kid. Right. Yeah. And so it wasn't until graduating school that I actually found a skill that was valuable to people that I could put some of the beginnings of that entrepreneurial spirit and merge the art and design part with the business part. I love that. How how do you answer when someone says, I don't have the budget or that's too yeah. expensive? Okay. The best tip I'm going to give to you is you don't fight people. And it's really weird because they see me usually debating with people. So if somebody says, I, I don't have the budget, I say, okay, totally understand. This is probably not an important thing for you to do. High-end running shoes are essential to you and how you move out in the world. And you know the cost of, of buying a cheaper pair probably that you, you, you might actually do some damage to your own body. And that's important to you. Whereas you may not want to pay $100 for an apple pie. Maybe that's not important to you. But there are other people who are apple pie aficionados. It's like, that is the best apple pie in the world. And it's worth $100 and waiting in line. So what we need to do is to not focus on what we think is valuable, because it's very subjective. We need to find out what's valuable to you. So Brian, if a logo is not valuable to you, I want to find out what is valuable to you. And if you can tell me that, then I can start to search in my brain. Is that something I can do or not? If I can't, I want to recommend you to somebody. And if I have no answers, I say, well, that's that's a difficult challenge. I, I don't know how to help you. And I appreciate the conversation. I think the mistake that creative people have is they think every time somebody reaches out, you must close the sale. And that pressure to close the sale, it, it puts you, your mindset into this thing where you're, you're like, it's not a good fit. And you know it's not a good fit. It's not good for them. It's not good for you. But you push forward and you you make all kinds of concessions only ultimately to hate your your own life at that point because now you're stuck doing something in less time than you, than you want and getting paid next to nothing because you convince yourself before you even talk to the client that you must do this. And not to do it is a reflection of your own self-worth. Oh, I'll do it for cheap this time because next time, they're going to yeah. pay me full market value. And then the time after that, then I'm going to be making 10x market value and I'll really be doing well. That no. never happens. <laughs> it never happens. Because why would you pay more for something you already got for less money? So you're talking about the anchor and anchor is like it's a form of bias. We, we kind of tend to stick too much with the first piece of information that we get. Yeah. And there's been all kinds of experiments that, that have been done to to prove this out. So it's very important if you're going to talk about money, especially if you know that the clients can't afford you, if you, if you just know this, you need to drop an anchor that's quite high. And one that they might even like laugh out loud, literally. And I'll do this. And this is one, one of the techniques that I, I use quite often. Uh, an entrepreneur will call me up and said, Chris, uh, the founders and I love your work. We want to do work with you. And when they say that to me right away, I think they cannot afford me. Yeah. And why, why that? Because founders don't call me and co-founders don't call me because they have a team of people who will call you 
if they're a bigger company. So I'm already like, bing, something's going on here. So yep. I said, look, this is fantastic. I'm so grateful that you're calling. I just need to talk about money for a little bit. Now, I don't even know what you need. I don't even know if I can do it for you. But I do know that if you can't afford $30,000 just to start talking to me, it's not going to happen. I don't want to waste your time. And I'm talking about to do discovery work. I'm not even talking about making the thing. And are you still in your chair? So I'll make a little joke about it. You know, are you sitting down kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So then they're like, oh, okay. And so that hits them really hard. And I know what they're thinking most of the time. They're thinking that is way more money than I was even prepared to spend. And I want to pretend right now that I'm still in the market for this, even though I know this is crazy. Mm -hmm. And so they'll engage in the conversation with you for a little bit longer. And it's usually during this period that I genuinely try to help them find somebody else other than me. Right. Human psychology is like, I want what I can't have. Why is this person charging this amount of money? Why, why are they not even interested in exploring this further? And this becomes really intriguing. So usually I end the conversation with something like, you know, I'm going to send some people your way. And if you feel like they're not going to work out for you and you want to send, spend real money with me, then let's take it further. And that's usually when they're like, my God, they're going to start to figure it out. Right. <laughs> or they're not. And that's fine either way. Yeah. That's anchoring. Yeah. But there's also so many other really smart, subtle techniques there that I want to highlight. Uh, one okay. of them, one of them is scarcity. What you talked about is creating scarcity. Um, to saying, listen, I know you want the Ferrari, but it sounds like you can only afford the Toyota. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with Toyotas at all. They make a ton of them. They're very reliable cars and they're very affordable. And, and maybe that's what you ought to be getting. You, you know, you have no business shopping for a Ferrari. Yeah. That's a thing. Um, mm -hmm. but if you truly want a Ferrari, they're scarce, they're hard to get, you know, a little bit expensive, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're creating this scarcity model, which is another also way to say you're, you're flipping the script and you, you are, well, it's a one way to say to, uh, get, gain back the control, but maybe another way to say it is that you are picking your clients. Yes. You're picking each other if you think about it. And yeah. I, I like to make these analogies where it's it's like a dating relationship. Yeah. Uh, because somebody said hello to you at the bar doesn't mean that that's an automatic connection. You have to find out, are you aligned? I mean, if you're not just looking for a quick hookup, if you're looking for something more, you're, you're going to want to talk to them and just find out. And, and a lot of times it's really saying to yourself, are we a good fit for each other? And you may not know what a good fit is, so I'm going to help you by asking a few questions. And through that, since I'm the professional, I'm the expert at this, I'll make a recommendation that this is not it. I can't do this job in two days. I'm not yeah. saying it can't be done, just I can't do it. Yeah. And I'll even make the argument, I'm not even saying I'm worth this amount, but if you want to work with me, this is what it's going to cost. I yeah. do this all the time. Yeah. And then basically, you're going to get rid of a lot of people who are not a good fit for you, as you should. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if there's a takeaway from this short little conversation, it's it's that it is okay to say no. Yeah, I think you should start with the default of, I don't know if this is going to work. Yeah. And then try to get creative and see like, oh, no, okay, they passed that test. And oh, yes, I can do that thing. And this is a test that they think is worth solving, and they're going to spend some money to do it. I mean, if you think about this, people who come to you and say, look, I need this, but I'm only going to spend that. And if those two are not in alignment, one of these two statements is true, right? It's either yeah. I really don't need this and that's therefore the price I'm going to pay. Like I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I was at a furniture sale building next door. I walk in there. I see this, uh, this piece of artwork of an American flag kind of collage together. I said, how much is that? In my mind, I'm like, I don't really want this. I don't really need it. And the price that he said was way too high. And I'm like, is that your best price? And I just say, no, and we just walk away. And that's that because I don't really need that. And no matter how good of a salesperson that person is, there's no amount of convincing that's going to make me pay five times as much as I was ready to pay. Right. So rather than, it should have just been like, what is valuable to you in this thing of all the things I have to sell? And then we'll talk about that. And that's yeah. really all it is. Um, you know that uh, famous sell me this pen thing from Jordan Belfort? Sure. Wolf of Wall Street. Well, he was interviewed by uh, Pierce Morgan and he's like, Jordan, sell me this pen. 
I think it was Pierce Morgan, right? He said, sell me this pen. He goes, Yo, so here's the thing. I don't even know if you need a pen like that. Do you like expensive high-end pens? And then he says, so what's happening here? So it's a trick question. When when they the salesperson says, sell me this pen, people automatically default into pitch mode. Mm -hmm. They start talking about how fine of a writing instrument it is, how well balanced it is, and they're just selling. They're just talking about themselves. And a yeah. real salesperson just sits like, does a pen like this even matter to somebody like you? Yes. What do you value? Right. And so there's this thing that I've learned by uh, first experience, then reading in books that people are really irrational. We're very emotional and we mm -hmm. think we're way more logical than we really are. And it's just not true. Yeah. So like you, you talk about cars. We need some form of transportation to get from point A to point B, especially in kind of modern cities. Right. The bus will get you from point A to point B. Mm hmm. Um, and as you said, the Ferrari will also do the same job. But the feeling I have associated with one or the other says a lot about my my feelings about myself, my worldview, about the kind of status I want to hold. And status is a lot more important than people think. So oh, when yeah. I was uh, when I was in high school, I was not in a position where my parents were going to buy me a car. So I rode the shame train. That's what it was called. And that's how I felt riding it. Mm -hmm. And the friends whose parents gave them cars or people who were able to buy their own car, they had status. Yeah. And that's why you have these things. That's the difference between a Timex watch and a Rolex watch. The difference between a Toyota and a Ferrari. It's because we have an emotional connection to these things that's totally irrational. If you start to understand that, then you can start to understand what motivates people. I love that. And maybe it's a good transition to talk about brand okay. because, you know, while, while we are trying to build our brand, maybe some, those are some of the important questions we need to ask ourselves, you know, does perception matter? You know, if you're trying to build a high end hotel, uh, but you, you know, you spend budget to do it, those things are not congruent, right? You're going to, yes. you need to sort of have the look if, if you're building the Ritz Carlton, let's say, for example, um, you have a certain image to uphold. And so if you're coming to a designer like you and saying, I need the Ritz Carlton, but I can only afford to pay motel six. <laughs> we have a problem. We have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And so what should people be thinking about, or maybe what are some of the common mistakes people make with, with building their brand? I think we have the grass is greener syndrome where we get overly aspirational. And we're not really understanding who we are and how we fit in the marketplace. You can be very, very successful at the low end category as well as the high end category. The ones yeah. in the middle, if you look at the inverted bell curve, they're the ones that usually get slaughtered. It's because when I want a cheaper option, I go with that. And when I want the, the experience, I go with the other one. I go super high end like the Ritz Carlton. Now, if we had to, to place the spectrum of valuable brands and and whether they're upscale or down market, you and I probably could come up with some of the high end ones really quickly and the low end ones. The ones in the middle are much harder to remember. It's because they don't really know who they are. And I like to just begin there to say, like, to have an honest conversation. Like, really, are, are, if you say you're the most premium, fill in the blank, prove it. How so? Right. From, from bottom to uh, from top to bottom, bottom to top, everything you do is at the, the utmost highest quality. Yes or no? And if it's not, you're 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 not telling the truth. Uh, at least you're. I don't want to say you're not lying. You're you're lying, but you're not telling the truth. You're not being honest about yourself, right? The yeah. the film Jiro Dreams of Sushi. He is considered the world's best sushi chef, and the amount of care and love he puts into his food. I will pay that amount. Like I normally would not want to spend that amount of money on food, but yeah. if I were, I would do it with him for sure because it's there. So let's have an honest conversation about ourselves. And more importantly, we should sit down and think in the marketplace, how do we want to be positioned? What kind of space do we want to occupy in the mind of the client? And if we can carve out a little space there, I think we can do really well. Yeah. So, and how does that relate to then when someone like, let's go back mm -hmm. to the people who are watching, who are creatives mm -hmm. and we get tasked with, you know, this enormous project that may result in enormous payoff for the brand, but the brand is asking the designer to do it for less. How does, how should we answer that? 
Okay, very good. So let's just say their intentions are good, that they actually are going to create this really big, wonderful thing. All entrepreneurs want to spend less money than what it costs to do, for sure. You want to spend less on the sheets, the, the stemware, to, to the logo and the identity design. You're, you're going to because you're a shrewd business person and that's why you're at the top. We get that. So, And, and everybody, everybody does, by that's yeah. common sense. You go to buy a car, used or new, you want to feel like you walked away, you know, uh, you know, you won. The dealer lost, you won. Yeah. Right. So I, I want to say this thing because the word brand gets thrown around a lot, especially for, for my people, the designers out there. And most of the people who describe themselves as branding experts are actually logo design experts or identity design experts. They yet have to understand what a brand is. They think the brand is just what it looks like on a business card, and it's not branding at all. So you first yeah. have to educate yourself on this and not just use terms because they seem sexy and they seem they make you feel more powerful. But branding is strategic. It includes marketing and it includes aspects of visual design. But it really, you're doing experience design. So all brands have multiple touch points from the way that the person answers the phone to the way that they leave a note for you at the, the end of your service. All those parts have to be thought up and to be consistent from beginning to end because it only takes one break yeah. in that chain for the for the story the narrative to start to fall apart the ritz carlton for yeah. example is known as the like the world's best service for hotels right there's nothing that they won't do to try to to, to help you and make you happy and so if they start having employees that don't feel that that don't believe that sooner than later people have a different impression and it's this impression that yeah. you try to influence, you can't wholly control, is what you need to do. So if you're a designer and you want to help like a high-end brand, you have to say, like, do I possess the skills? Do I know enough people to bring into this so that I can actually deliver on this? And if you can't, don't try and oversell it because it's going to be embarrassing for you and it's going to be bad for the client. So let's say now, yeah. okay, I do actually possess those skills. I, I've, I've read Marty Neumeier's books. I've gone to the workshops. I'm ready to go and I have these skills. Okay. So now the client says, we don't want to pay that. Then we have to say, because you know why? Because they're just focused on the number. So if you can't talk about value, then people will focus on price. So what we need yeah. to do is talk about so, value. So so then, okay, let's, let's continue okay. this dialogue mm -hmm. and let's role play okay. a little bit. So I'm the yes. client. I'm the client and I say, listen, this project is going to be huge if if it's successful. Mm -hmm. And if it is, it's going to make us millions, mm -hmm. right? I just can't afford your, you know, $100,000 design mm -hmm. fee. You know, we have the potential to make, you know, $10 million. Okay. But like, I don't know if it's going to work. It, it will probably work. There's a what good chance. That it will we work? wouldn't do it. <laughs> what are What's the odds that? that it'll work, Brian? What do you think? What do you, what shot do you give yourself? 50-50? Yeah. I think it's uh I think we have a 70% oh, chance. Oh, that's actually more confident than I thought. Okay. And and this is where I would say something like, you know, do you believe in this that you should uh put in a big effort for a big result versus a small effort for a big result? Well, I would uh, so if we're still role playing, I'd say, well, we'd like to of course pay you what you're worth, but we just can't. We can't afford it. You know, we're spending money in so many other places that this is as much budget as, as I've got. Okay, so you say you can't afford the hundred thousand. What can you afford? So, you know, we talked about maybe a quarter oh, of that. Oh wow, that's a lot less. Okay, and how many shots at this do you have to make work? Like if you were to spend twenty five K, forget about me in this conversation. If you had to spend twenty five K and it didn't work out. Does that hurt your chances? Can you do it four times? No. Right. I mean, I'm, I might lose my job. That would not be good. That's the result we're trying to prevent. So I see that you're, you're feeling like this is a risk to spend this kind of money, but it's also risky not to spend this kind of money. So you're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, right? I okay. am, yeah. So, so Brian, before I say no, before I say no, I, I want to get really creative with you. How can we do this where you could walk away with the degree of confidence that you're making the right strategic smart move in terms of how you're spending money. Is there another way we can look at this besides whether it's going to be 25,000 or not? I really don't know, Chris, how to pull from other buckets. You know, I'm, I'm in charge of this P and L 
and other, you know, brand managers are in charge of their P and L, but you know, I don't, I don't have control over that. I've only got, I can only do what I can do. Okay. I have an idea. It's a crazy idea. And, and tell me if I'm crazy, right? I, I believe this, whoever carries the burden of risk should make the lion's share of the profit. So when you told me we need to do X to get a $10 million result, I thought $100,000 was actually very reasonable because that's that's like less than 1% of what you're talking about here. So you're carrying the risk by spending the money up front. So you should capture $9.9 .9 million if you win. If I took some of the risk with you, would it be fair for me to also capture some of the win? So if I can do this, say, for $50,000, I know that's more than what you want to spend. Could I also capture part of the back end if you hit certain milestones? Are you open to that idea? That's a great idea. I love that. That's very creative. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so that would be the end of the yeah. scene, right? So I, I understand, like, just as a business person, right? You don't want to throw away money. You can get fired either way. If it doesn't work or you spend too much, you're going to get fired. And I don't want that to happen. Yeah. I, I love that creative thinking. And I'm glad that we did that little exercise mm -hmm. because that's happened to me more than once where we have said, how, how about stock? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or how about, how about getting paid on the back end? Or there's, there's also more than just monetary right. things that I care about, right? That there's creative ways to find a solution instead of just saying no, or like, that's the end of it. Or I think, you're one of the masters of finding, and there's still infinite options, yes, there right? We, ha we, haven't invented, we haven't invented all of them. You just have to find out two things. What's important yes. to them? And this is the order important, I think. is for, uh, The order is mm -hmm. important first. What's important to them first, like you just did? And then what's important to you? Yeah. And then when you're both mutually happy, then it's going to be a great partnership. Absolutely. There's a couple of things I want to point out to people who are listening to this, like what the heck just happened there, right? One thing that I try to do as much as possible is to understand your concern, your point of view, because I want to walk next to you. I don't want to walk against you or push against you. So it's like, I'm Brian. Yeah. And if I spend too little and this doesn't work, I'm screwed. And if I spend a whole lot of money and it blows up in my face, I'm screwed. So I want to come from a place of empathy. And if I'm going to say, yeah, that is a lot of money, I agree with you. And I know even $50,000 is a lot for you. I think you start to say like, okay, I'm not talking to someone who's deaf. They can, they can hear. They can hear what I'm saying and, and they can feel my pain and they're willing to work with me. And if you feel yeah. like we're in a, a space where we can work together and be creative and collaborative, I think options start to open up. Yeah. The other thing, if I could offer yeah. my two cents is I love the way you asked, you know, what is affordable and all that. Most of the time, wherever and whenever possible, I do not offer a cost. I asked what your budget is because I tell you nine times out of 10, I've had sort of a dollar amount in my mind, what I think I could mm -hmm. do it for. And that number has been the number that they've said has been 10 X <laughs> above. Yes. And it's like, Oh, I mean, can you do this? Could you do this commercial? Could you direct this and produce this for a quarter million yeah. dollars? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Let me let me yes, let me check can. my schedule for us. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that's doable. Um, and so, yeah, I would say don't be too quick to throw out that number because you you might be leaving opportunities on yes. the table. So there's two schools of thought on this, and it's very, really interesting. Like when you read enough books, like every idea contradicts another idea, right? So I'm I'm a fan of both. Like Blair ends and his win without pitching manifesto. He says you must say the price first because you're going to use the anchor bias. Only if you know what you're doing, you could drop a high enough anchor, right? right? On the other side, there's Chris Voss and never split the difference. He's like, do not say the number first because generally speaking, you're going to say a number too low, like your example, and you're going to screw yourself over. And there's a couple of famous examples he cites in the book. And so I I, I then say to people who I, I do workshops with, I say, you need to know first of all, can this person afford you? And that's why I gave that other example. Like when the CEO, the founders call me, I know that they can't afford me because my minimum level of engagement is going to be much higher. But if their marketing director calls, I don't talk about money at all because I know yeah. the budget's going to be big and I need to figure out what the full problem is before I start quoting numbers because those numbers yeah. will come back to bite you in the butt. Yeah. Let's take it back to the drawing okay. board a little bit and talk about people who are just getting started you know, behind you 
and I've seen your videos. I've seen your beautiful studio and, you know, your artwork, your portfolio is significant. And um, some of us don't have yes. that luxury. Some of us are just getting started. Uh, there's an old, I'm a quote okay. person. I like quotes. There's this quote I heard. I think it was one of the signers of the declaration. Maybe it was John Adams or something. He said, in essence, in S, I am nothing. In possess, I am everything, which to me means, you know, like if you just looked at me or, you know, just me uh, on the surface, I may not look like much on paper, but like what I'm actually capable of, again, back to the office, that Michael Scott quote, you have no idea how high I can fly, you know, when he says that as he gets fired from the his own paper <laughs> company. Um you have no idea how yeah. high I can fly. And and I possess a ton of talents, although I don't look at it, mm. look like it. So how, how do I how do I deal mm. with that? Like you talk about um, you know, make sure that you work with people who can afford mm-hmm. you. But what if it's the opposite? You don't you don't look like much. You look like you're, you know, from the streets. Yeah. You're gritty, mm-hmm. you know, you're green, but you're like, you know. I'm not a big fan of Mark Zuckerberg, but I have to give credit where it's due. The kid is a genius, right? And now as an adult, he's taking over the world. H- how do we convey that? How do, how do we handle yeah. that? Okay. This one's tricky. That's a very good question. I think this is going to take some time to kind of sort through. I, I think one of the things we all need to realize that everybody, including Mark Zuckerberg, started with not a lot and doesn't look like a lot. But the external doesn't always reflect the internal. If you know you're talented, if you know your your heart, your mind, your soul, and spirit is in the right place, and you know there's wonderful things that you can do, but you're still driving a beat up car and you go to the meeting and you don't really have a legit office, none of that really matters because the moment that you're able to express and communicate the depth of your thinking and your expertise, uh, the game has changed. So you have to just get over the initial perception pushback that mostly I think comes from your mind. And if you let it eat you up and you walk in there kind of really apologetic and your posture is bad and you're looking to the ground, you're not exactly signaling to the other person, I'm a person you can trust a lot of money to, right? And we have to understand the buyer of these services, they have a lot at risk as well. Their professional reputation is on the line when they make the wrong choice. So it's your job to really to let the internal parts of who you think you are to be expressed in action and in words. And this is really critical. So when I first started, for the first two office spaces I had, Brian, I worked out of my house. And the first house was a downtown loft in Boyle Heights in a place that my parents were scared to come and visit me, right? It's industrial, (laughs) there's homeless people, there's all kinds of like weird shady stuff. And my clients came there from a billion dollar, uh, uh, what is it, beauty and health brand, their executives drove out to, and I know what they were thinking. This is super scary. <laughs> and they parked the cars like, Are, is your car still going to be there when you leave? But you know what? The work yeah. spoke for itself. And I treated them as yeah. as professional as a 20-year-old kid could at that time. And now jumping forward, yeah. I bought a house in Venice with my wife. And again, Venice is not, it's not Irvine. It's a little sketchy. Right? Well, well, I mean, yes. <laughs> I can argue. It's you know, a, so it's, it's a cool a town, town. But right? even, that, yeah, like in the 90s, uh, Venice was what they joked about all the time, where the trash meets the sea. There's like a lot of bohemian, yeah. uh, homeless, gangsters. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. And my yeah. clients from probably BBDO or wherever they came from, from major, major retail brands, literally parked on the street. I didn't have parking. I didn't have valet. I had nothing. They'd walk through the front yard, backyard garden and walk into my studio. And I'm sure they're thinking the same thing because you know why? My producers at that time were working out of my house with me. They're like, Chris, what are we going to do about this? I'm like, do about what? I was so confident in the work. (laughs) It's like, look, if you're not comfortable, I I can't have you representing me. I can't have you being the client liaison because you have to believe that I believe that the work is superior and it was and we won millions of dollars of business that way so if you don't believe it yeah it's gonna come across and it's not gonna be and they're gonna pick up those vibes and the vibes are not good 
at the end of the day, you can look at me in all different kinds of ways and the way I present myself with my earrings and my glasses and my sneakers. They're like, who is this person? But when they sit down with you and I ask the thoughtful question and I do what few designers do, which is actually to listen, they're like, this person is thinking. They're asking these kinds of questions and there's a depth there. Yeah. Well, and it's a law of attraction thing too, right? You know, you want to you want to work with the people that that get you, that like you, respect you. And I'm glad that you gave me that answer because I I mm -hmm. am afraid that there's a lot of people and it's it's not has nothing to do with age, but they're yes. fronting. Either either they've got, you know, an, a seventy thousand dollar Land yes. Rover lease that's yep. over their head. Um or they're leasing that office space with a thirty foot psych. Uh, in the back and they can't mm -hmm. make rent or, you know, they're just living beyond in order to create the facade of being successful or, you know, in the caliber of working with a high end brand yeah. or the, or what. And, and I think that's a mistake. Yeah. I think it, it it is unfortunately like we all do it to a degree or the other. And Seth talks about this in his book, right? He says people like us do things like this. So successful people like us yeah. drive cars like this. Successful photographers that we hire have successful looking studios like this, and we fall into that trap. And if if it ever came up um, that somebody's like, why isn't your office bigger, or why isn't uh, there a thirty thousand dollar computer sitting in front of you? And I, I would say, and I, luckily I've never had to say this to them. Would you like me to pay for that and charge you for it? Or would you just rather to see it in the work? Because those things, while they're running idle, cost the company a lot. And we're in a business, to be in business, we need to make money. So somebody's going to pay for that. And all of a sudden, I take a yeah. deficit and turn it into a positive. And we've often used in yeah. the sales process, and I say, look, you are talking to the owner, the creative director, and everybody that's going to be working on your project. There is no B team because we only have one team. I know the other company has 500 people and just ask yourself who's actually going to be doing the work. And that would be that yeah. conversation. Yeah. A point taken. It, does it matter how it gets done or does it matter what the result is? Right. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, so I can say that I promise you the work will be good. I promise I will treat you with respect and listen to what you have to say and deliver the best customer service. Everything else if that's what matters to you, hire the company that does that. Yeah. And you know this, Brian. Like, if you were rocking, um, like, uh, an Alexa camera, all of a sudden, people are like, whoa! Because they know that's an expensive camera. Well, and I'll confess here that sometimes we do it by design. Yes. Because I know, I know for a fact that if we have a certain budget level mm -hmm. and I bring a DSLR to that camera shoot, which can shoot as well or better for my purposes because I know I know the specs, I know the layout, yep. it's much mm -hmm. more you know nimble, quicker setup, all the advantages. I know if I bring that SLR and I don't bring the red camera, I'm yeah. gonna get looks like, ooh, are you sure? <laughs> I you know, my son has that camera. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> why, why did I just pay you so much money to do that? Yeah. So it does it does matter on certain levels, and it's too bad that it does. Perception, you know is a thing. Um, yeah. And it matters uh, externally, internally, right? Because I know I have had uh, cinematographers work with me. They're like, we need that camera. Like you need that camera. Like you're saying that that camera makes you, well, no, I'm not saying that. Well, so what do you need? Right. We've seen mm -hmm. amazing cinematographers shoot commercials for Apple strictly on the iPhone X. And if you didn't know, you wouldn't know. That's right. So really the skill is what matters. It's not the, the sensor or all that kind of stuff. The camera that you're more familiar with is the superior camera, period. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think that can be extrapolated to all the tools. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now everyone wants to know what's up with the book. Okay. The book. The book is uh, it's something I didn't want to do. Something that I want to be honest with you. I didn't think um, I, I'm, a I'm a person in a place where I think I can write something and people would want that. But through the encouragement and the support of our community, I've been able to kind of jot down a lot of the ideas that have really shaped my thinking and how I've become successful. The book is by design a book that I would like to read myself, which is 
basically an idea written in the most economical way that I know how. And it's a collection of all of the lessons I've learned from the teachers. And I put teachers kind of in air quotes here in my life from, from maybe uh, from my father or from my business coach or my teacher virtually like somebody that I've read a book on. And, it's, and I think that's a beautiful idea. And I want to be able to share that. I, I'm also trying to make it as friendly as possible for creative types. This isn't a book that rehashes the same idea 45 times, which some books tend to do. It's really broken up, I think, into six or seven chapters about mindset, about business, about marketing. And if that's a chapter that interests you, you would just read that. And the idea is this is not a book that you read from cover to cover. It's one where you you read and you think and you try to apply what you've learned. And I would guess that you sort of wrote it modularly so that if you are already good at X, you might cherry pick Y and focus on that. Yes. Uh, the the ideas that are in the book started off, many of them, as conversations I had online, ideas that resonated with people. And then I just took those ideas and I kind of pre-test or pre-validate them because there, there was high engagement. And I, I started to think, well, if I had, with, without the constraints of Twitter or social media, like what does this look like and what visuals would I pair with it? And so each page on one half of the page is, a design that encapsulates the idea in a visual form. And then, then it's the writing part on the other side. Yeah. And who's it for? Is it just for designers? I mean, designers are my tribe. So I would say like, that's who I tend to write for people in the space, but I, I have a very broad definition of design and I'm going to borrow from Marty Neumeyer who quoted Herbert Simon, uh, the Nobel laureate, I think. Um, and he talked about design is uh, is someone who devises a course of action to improve or change an existing condition to preferred one. So if anybody tries to take the way things are to the way things they should be, you're a designer because you're trying to make it better. And design typically is uh, something that people think about as like posters and toasters. And, and design is so much more than that. Poppin' on a west side, cause it's why I stay I just made a thousand, blue it ain't face I've been going in, oh, I'ma close the case I can't wait no more, man, I gotta blow the day Poppin' on a west side, cause it's why I stay I just made a thousand, blue it ain't face I've been going in, oh, I'ma close the case I can't wait no more